London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. I uh, rise today on behalf of the uh, Ontario NDP caucus to, uh, to speak to Bill 114, the Anti-Racism Act, uh, during third reading debate. And I have to say, Speaker, that I rise uh, with somewhat mixed emotions this morning. Uh, this is a day that should truly be a day of celebration in this province. It is a day when we come together uh, in this legislature to, to demonstrate unity, to show our shared resolve, our strong commitment to dealing with uh, racial injustice in this province, to advancing uh, racial equity, to eliminating uh, uh, systemic racism, uh, to addressing the deeply entrenched, embedded barriers that black communities, indigenous communities have experienced for decades, the hate-motivated attacks against Jewish communities and, and uh, Muslim communities uh, that have uh, only uh, grown more frequent uh, in the recent past. So we have before us a piece of legislation that is taking very strong and uh, important steps to dealing with that uh, uh, completely unacceptable uh, 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 issue in, in our province. Uh, and yet, and yet, in the face of this, in the face of this third reading uh, debate that we are having today, I, I, have to, uh, I have to reflect on the process that led to this third reading uh, version of the bill, uh, the process that took us through the clause-by-clause -clause debate on this legislation just a couple of days ago uh, on Monday of this week. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot from this government throughout the announcement of the anti-racism strategy, throughout the uh, bringing forward of this bill, uh, that collaboration is absolutely essential if we are to effectively deal with systemic racism. We agree, and yet that process that uh, that uh, was took us through the uh, clause by clause uh, analysis of this bill on Monday was not collaborative. Speaker, uh, sadly, it showed a pettiness on behalf of the government that I found, uh, quite frankly, uh, uh, unacceptable. Um, I was, uh, you know, I saw the government playing games with the time allocation motion that the government itself had written. Uh, let's remember, Speaker, this Liberal government has a majority. They have complete control over the contents of their time allocation motion. They have com com complete control over how long uh, they will allocate to debate on a bill, over the deadlines by which uh, amendments have to be submitted, uh, over the length of debate that is going to take place uh, during this uh, third reading process. The government's time allocation motion on this bill set a deadline, a, a time, you know, a specific time deadline for amendments to be submitted, and so one would have expected that the government would honour that deadline, that the government would be prepared to review amendments that were received in advance of that deadline. Otherwise, why would they have set that deadline? They should have been, you know, they should have been staffed up, ready to review amendments and to consider uh, the impact of those amendments on this legislation. Legislation. And instead, uh, what we saw on Monday was that every single amendment that was submitted by the NDP caucus within the deadline that had been determined in the time allocation motion uh, was rejected by this government uh, under the, uh, the rationale that the government had not had time to review the NDP amendments. These were amendments that were submitted within the process that the government itself created. And, uh, uh, and yet the government showed no willingness, no interest whatsoever to consider the amendments that the NDP put forward. One wonders why this government created a timeline that they were not in any way prepared to respect uh, in dealing with this bill. 
Uh, you know, in, if we were engaged in a process of collective bargaining, this would be called bad faith bargaining, Speaker. It did not show good faith on behalf of this government. It did not show a willingness to collaborate, a willingness to listen to all sides and, uh, and strengthen the legislation that was before us and, uh, and move forward in the interests of the people of this province on an issue that must be addressed, on an issue that, that has a profound impact on, on, uh, on black Ontarians, on, on our Muslim communities, on our Jewish communities, on our Indigenous First Peoples in this province. And yet we saw the government completely unwilling to even, to even uh, review the amendments that the NDP put forward. And I have to say, Speaker, what was particularly galling for me as the NDP representative during that clause-by-clause process Process, was that uh, the government kept telling me that I had uh, declined, that the NDP had declined uh, the government's uh, uh, outreach uh, to, uh, to engage in a conversation about amendments. I have to say, Speaker, that my office received a single email from the minister's office on Friday uh, at 2.30 in the afternoon, a Friday of constituency week, when MPPs were not here at Queen's Park, inviting me to a conversation about the amendments. And this was on a Friday when the amendments were being considered on a Monday. Now, I do not consider that a, uh, you know, a good faith uh, 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 openness to having a, a, an honest conversation, a genuine conversation about about amendments. Uh, in fact, uh, what it turned out to be was uh, to provide the government an excuse uh, to dismiss uh, all NDP amendments that were submitted uh, during clause by clause, to reject every single NDP amendment on the grounds that the amendments were received too late when they were received well within the timeline that the government had set in its time allocation motion. And the, the effect of this speaker was that it, it prevented any substantial debate on the amendments that the NDP proposed that spoke directly to the input that was received during uh, public input on this bill. It allowed the government to evade uh, going on the record in any way to try to explain their refusal to listen to the input that had been heard and to incorporate uh, some of the very legitimate concerns that had been brought forward uh, by the deputies who spoke to the committee. I'm, uh, I'm going to speak at length to uh, a couple of the, of the amendments that the NDP had brought forward that were dismissed uh, by the government with en without any kind of explanation as to why they would not support them except to say that they were received too late when they were received within the uh, well within the uh, the deadline that had been set in the government's time allocation motion but before i do that speaker i i, I do want to make absolutely clear that the ndp caucus uh, uh, fully supports this bill we agree that the amendments that were made uh, uh, during the committee process have strengthened this bill and that uh, and that in 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 many ways they speak to to the input that was received uh, during uh, the, uh, the the public input uh, in particular uh, I want to uh, I want to acknowledge the changes that were made to explicitly name anti-semitism and Islamophobia in this uh, in this bill this was very very important to uh, to many Many of the uh, presenters who came before uh, the committee and the new language that is included in this bill, I think, goes a long way to addressing uh, the, uh, the concerns that were raised. And, and most importantly, it does that in a way that does not diminish the, uh, the historic marginalization, the ongoing exclusion uh, and the displacement of, uh, of black communities and indigenous uh, communities uh, in this province. So, Speaker, the amendments that have been included are unquestionably uh, constructive, uh, they are positive, and I think they are helpful in moving us forward collectively as a province uh, to eliminate uh, systemic racism uh, in Ontario.
Unfortunately, uh, the same kind of openness, the same kind of respect uh, was not demonstrated by the government uh, in its response to uh, concerns that were raised by, by multiple uh, deputants to the, uh, to the committee about the exclusion of health information custodians from the data collection requirements uh, of the bill. So currently, Section 6 uh, uh, of the bill excludes health information custodians uh, from having to engage in the uh, in the collection of data and the uh, analysis of data that is just so critical to ensuring the success of Ontario's anti-racism initiatives. Uh, during the uh, public input, we heard from the Association of Ontario Health Centres. We heard from Colour of Poverty, Colour of Change. We heard from Metro Toronto Chinese and Southeast Asian Legal Clinic. We heard from the Ontario Association of Agencies Serving Immigrants that the exclusion of health information custodians is going to undermine is going to undermine the effectiveness of this bill in understanding the impact of systemic racism and in actually moving forward with effective strategies to address uh, uh, that systemic racism. And I'm going to read at some length from some of the, uh, the uh, comments that were made uh, during Clause by Clause uh, about the exclusion of health information custodians. The Ontario Association of, uh, of, uh, of uh, or the Association of Ontario Health Centres uh, noted that if Bill 114 excludes health service providers from the requirement to collect data that can help identify and monitor systemic racism and racial disparities in Ontario, then the broad goal of a health equity approach to planning, as set out in the government's Patient First Act, will not be effectively achieved. We know that racism is one of the determinants of health. It's well documented that Indigenous populations, as well as Black communities, experience the worst health outcomes in Ontario. This is entrenched through systemic racism, but it is virtually impossible to address systemic racism, in particular anti-Indigenous and anti-Black racism, as described in the preamble of Bill 114, without collecting race-based data. Excluding health service providers from the requirement to collect data, including race-based data, is inconsistent with the province's own health equity mandate and indeed works to ensure ongoing inequity and entrenchment of systemic racism. The, the, Ontario, uh, or the Association of Ontario Health Centres goes on to say, it's not clear what rationale there is for excluding health service providers from this requirement to collect data, including personal information. Community health centres, our members, are health information custodians and have been collecting race-based and socio-demographic data for years, often with the most vulnerable populations who they serve. Indeed, in the last few years, the Toronto Central Local Health Integration Network has mandated that all health service providers collect social, democratic social demographic data, including race-based data, so we know that it is possible for health service providers to collect personal information without contravening privacy laws. And, Speaker, when the NDP brought forward a motion to address this very concern, a, re a concern that was repeated uh, in multiple multiple deput deputations uh, during public input, uh, instead of the government explaining why they were rejecting the amendment uh, that the NDP had brought forward so that the legislation would cover health uh, information custodians, the government dismissed the NDP's uh, amendment without any kind of substan substantive debate at all. And, Speaker, this is a disservice to the people who came and presented to the committee, to the organizations that had surveyed their members, who, the organizations that are dealing with the impact of systemic racism on the front lines on a daily basis, uh, the organizations that, that include people with lived experience of racism who understand uh, what the impact is, and in particular, the impact on health outcomes. And the government gave no explanation as to why uh, the, the legislation could not be amended to address this concern.
Speaker, um, you know, having having made that, uh, having made my uh, my concern clear uh, about the process uh, uh, that led to uh, to this uh, third reading version of the bill, I I do want to say that uh, that New Democrats recognize how vital it is to collect um, uh, data. To, uh, to create an impact assessment uh, framework that would help us understand uh, uh, the systemic uh, exclusion, the systemic discrimination that is experienced by racialized communities, by black communities, uh, indigenous communities, Jewish and Muslim communities uh, across this province. And we know, we know the benefits of collecting that data and understanding that data. We've seen it in policing, in education, in China child welfare. You know, Legal Aid Ontario has done a, uh, a really useful infographic uh, about uh, carding, uh, statistics on carding in various communities and how they, how they shine a light on the, the systemic biases that exist in policing that result in, uh, in uh, visible minority communities and black communities and Middle Eastern communities and indigenous communities being carded at uh, a much higher rate. Uh, you know, double the rate uh, than their actual um, than their actual representation within the uh, within the population. We saw just last month in a report from York University called "Towards Race Equity in Education" uh, how uh, how systemic barriers are reflected in uh, in public education in this province. Uh, we learned that uh, that the Toronto in the Toronto District School Board uh, that black students are are twice as likely to be enrolled in applied courses instead of academic courses compared to their counterparts from other racial backgrounds, and they are more than twice as likely to have been suspended from school at least once during high school. So, so data can shed a light on some of these practices and help us understand what changes have to be made to eliminate those barriers and, uh, and uh, improve equity for all, uh, all uh, uh, racialized communities in this province. I want to acknowledge the work of my colleague, uh, the, uh, the member for Hamilton Mountain, and, uh, and the concerns that she has consistently raised about the, uh, the over-representation of black children and indigenous children in the, uh, in the child welfare system. And, and again, uh, the data confirms this. We see that, uh, we see that in Toronto, 8% of, uh, of uh, uh, young people under the age of 18 are black, and yet 42% of children in care have at least one black black parent five times their representation in the general population so speaker uh, understanding uh, the impact of, uh, of race uh, in terms of access to uh, to services in Ontario is vital if we are going to uh, ensure a, pro a province that is fair uh, that that provides opportunity uh, for everyone and that enables uh, uh, all citizens to achieve their full potential. I, uh, I have to, uh, uh, or before I conclude, I, I wanted to, uh, to mention one other uh, amendment that was uh, proposed during the, uh, the public input uh, process. And again, uh, multiple uh, presenters talked about the need to establish an anti-racism secretariat and a disability rights secretariat uh, to, to uh, uh, complement the work of the anti-racism directorate. And you know, I, I was pleased to hear that, and I actually asked the uh, the people who had who had uh, made this recommendation in their uh, in their submissions uh, how they saw the work of an anti-racism secretariat as uh, distinct from an anti-racism directorate, and they talked about the need to have a completely independent arms-length body that is not answerable to the minister, that is not uh, you know that is not susceptible. To 
to the political winds of the day uh, to do this fundamentally important work. And in, this was a recommendation from Color of Poverty, Color of Change, from the Metro Toronto Chinese and Southeast Asian Legal Clinic, from the Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants, from the Ontario Federation of Labour. And uh, you know, Speaker, I, I have to um, I have to reflect on the fact that the anti-racism secretariat was an initiative long ago of a previous NDP government in this province. Uh, it was a, uh, a, a body that was created and that was embarking on this important work and was disbanded by the Conservatives when they took power. Yeah. Uh, but this is something that we must move forward with. And, you know, um, Whatever we do, whatever we do, we are not going to have an impact unless there is sustained political will, regardless of who is in government. We need to ensure that there is a shared commitment to moving forward on this, uh, on this critical work to ensure a province that is fair to all Ontarians. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you.